God is able to do abundantly above all. And then he thinks that's not enough. So then he writes this, God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that God, that you can ask your faith. So James began the, the, the series last weekend and uh, did a great job. You didn't get to hear that message. You're gonna to wanna to go back and hear it. But the name of the series is Jesus in the Center. And we're talking about Jesus in the center of our lives, but Jesus in the center specifically in our lives in different areas. And he did Jesus in the center of your stress. And so I'm going to do this week Jesus in the center of your prayers. So we're talking about Jesus in the center of our prayers. Um, I heard about a, a little boy that wanted a brother, and so he prayed for a month and nothing happened. Prayed for two months, nothing happened. Prayed for three months, no little brother. So he stopped praying. Well, about six months after that, his father took him to the hospital, pulled back a curtain, and there was a little brother. And uh, then the father pulled the curtain back a little farther, there was another little brother. <laughs> Pulled it back a little farther, another little brother. And so he said to the little boy, now aren't you glad you prayed? And the little boy said, yes, but aren't you glad I stopped after three months? <laughs> so we're gonna talk about prayer because prayer is something that we all feel like that we don't do it enough. Would you agree with that? Or at some point in our lives, maybe we feel that way. I feel that way. And so I wanna ask you some questions about prayer. You don't need to answer, but I want us to think about this. The first question is simple, and that is, does God have all power? And of course, yes, he does. We, we, some of, one of the attributes of God is that he's omnipotent. Omni comes from the word uh, the Latin word which means all, and potent would mean powerful. God is all powerful. So God has all power, but how do we get that power released on the earth? Do we pray long enough for something? And when we pray, this is going to be a strange question, but do our prayers bother God enough that he finally answers them. And one of the reasons I say that is because in Luke 18, Jesus told a parable um, about a, a widow and she bothered a judge so much that he said, so this, this widow doesn't bo keep bothering me, troubling me is the word, then I'll, I'm gonna give her what she wants. And he tells this parable so that we should always pray and, and not faint. But people misunderstand that because the judge is called an unjust judge. So that's not God. God is not the judge in that parable. And he, he basically turns around. You have to see the last verse that says, so if an unjust person would do this, how much more quickly will your Father who loves you answer your prayers? See what I'm saying? So make sure that you, you know prayer is not bothering God, okay? So we're gonna talk about prayer, and we're gonna talk about how do we got, get God to release power, but I'm going to, to, to show you that's actually a misconception because God has already deposited his power in us. And so prayer is completely different than what we think. It's not trying to get God to move, it's us releasing what God's already done in us. So let me give you three, three points, all right? And number one is that exactly what I just said. God has deposited his power in us. Now, these are not little quick, catchy points like I normally do to try to get you to remember them. So these are sentences. I'd like for you, if you could, to, to write them down, uh, even if you go back and listen to the message later, and I'd like for you to put them, all three of the points, on, a, on a, one of those sticky notes, if you have a sticky note. When, I, when Like Debbie just went out of town, when she goes out of town, she writes me things to do. And she puts them on sticky notes, and she puts them right there 
on the mirror so that I have to look around the mirror, you know, to do my hair. So, so she, she's trying to make sure that, that I'll do it. You see what I'm saying? Okay, so I don't know if you've ever done that, uh, but I, I'd really like for you to do whatever it is that would remind you, but just think about this. Put a sticky note with these three points and try to, try to memorize them and try to get the truth behind them, okay? So number one, God has deposited his power in us. Let me just show you two scriptures before we get more and, and we'll, we'll, we'll unpack all of this, right? Luke 24, verse 49. Now let me, let me say something before I read this. When you ask people what the last words of Jesus were, they tell you the Great Commission. Go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've taught you. And lo, I'm with you always. That lo, I'm with you always, could be a scripture for those of you who are afraid to fly. And lo, I'm, I'm okay, never mind. It's an, it's an old joke. It's a dad joke is what I've heard. So, um, but the bottom line is he said that in the 40 days after his resurrection, but those were not his last words. His last words are recorded in Luke 24 and Acts 1, right before he ascends, and his last words were actually, stay. Stay. Until you receive the Holy Spirit. And then go. Because if you go without the Holy Spirit, you have nothing to take. You have nothing to give. All right, so let me show you his last words here. Luke 24, verse 49. And now I will send the Holy Spirit. This is right before he ascends. You can go back and read it. Just as my father promised, but stay. Don't go yet. Stay. They stayed 10 more days. Here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes, watch, and fills you with power from heaven. Remember the point is God has deposited his power in us. Stay until you receive the Holy Spirit power from on high. And then in Acts 1, he tells them, wait or stay, wait for the promise of the Father. Verse 8 says, but you will receive power. You will, you will receive. You will get power deposited in you when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Everyone see that? So God puts his power in you in the person of the, the third person of the Godhead who is the Holy Spirit. Now I'm gonna show you another scripture, but I'm gonna quote part of it to you first. And that is, uh, don't put it up yet, Ephesians 3, and, and I think you remember this, verse 20 says that uh, he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. How many of you, and I want you to raise your hands all the campuses, how many of you have ever heard that verse? He's able to exceedingly abundantly above all. Okay, now, now um, I asked three pastors on our staff, what does the rest of the verse say? None of the three knew the answer. They are on administrative leave. <laughs> um, so, I'm just joking, I'm just joking. Um, but. Most of us, I just, I want you to be honest, do not ask Siri. Keep your phones down during the sermon. Do not ask Siri, okay? I just want you to be honest, because it should be most of you. Just be honest, you're in church, okay? How many of you don't know what the rest of the verse says? Can I see, okay, look at that, it's most of us, all right? How many of you, now you're not being prideful, but how many of you do know? Maybe you memorize this, how many of you do know? Okay, you might wanna uh, apply. We have three pastoral positions open <laughs> right now. All right, so let me show you because the first part of the verse um, doesn't work if you don't understand the second part. I mean, God does, but his power isn't released if you don't understand the second part. So Ephesians 3.20, now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, watch according to the power, the power that works in us. In us. Okay, we know the power is the Holy Spirit. Okay, 
The Holy Spirit's a person, but he is, once you get saved, he's the power. The only way that we could do greater works than Jesus did is because the Holy Spirit now is not just in one person, he's in all of us, okay? All right, so let me first of all just comment on this verse grammatically. I'm sorry, but I love grammar, okay? So uh, God adds three adverbs to this verse that would seem unnecessary, but there's a, there's a reason the Holy Spirit prompted Paul to write these. In other words, this verse could read, God is able to do all that we ask or think. And that's the same thing. God, I mean, God is able to do all. What, what, what does, how much is all? All. What, what, what is more than all? But when the, when the Holy Spirit is prompting Paul to write this, I, I, I guess he had the thought, you know, this really doesn't describe the power of the Godhead adequately, so I'm gonna put an, an adverb in there, above. God is able to do above all. How much is above all? I mean, all is all, above all. And then I guess he thought, that still doesn't describe the power of the Godhead, so I'm gonna put the word abundantly. God is able to do abundantly above all. And then he thinks that's not enough, so then he writes this, God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that God, that you could ask your thing. I mean, that's amazing, if you, even if you don't like grammar. That's amazing right there. God is a grammarian, by the way, if you didn't know. He's also a mathematician, my, my two favorite subjects. But anyway, he also is a scientist, which I did not do well in science. But, but here's the point. If God is able, and he is, has the ability to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, now I'm, this is gonna be strong when we'll say, then why doesn't he? I mean, that's the way we feel sometimes, let's be honest. Then why doesn't he in my marriage? Why doesn't he with this person that I prayed for who was sick and died? Why doesn't he? He's able. And this is how some people get bitter toward God. Because I know God has the power to do it. But he didn't do it. Okay. The second part we have to understand, according to the power that works in us. This word according in the Greek is the word kata. It means to the measure of. It also denotes distribution. So God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think to the measure that we distribute his power. In other words, he deposited his power in us and it depends on whether we distribute it or not. This is pretty amazing. It depends on the measure with which we distribute it. Let me say it another way, this is gonna shock you. God's unlimited power is limited on this earth to our prayers. That's amazing. For some reason, God decided to partner with us instead of just do and fix everything in our lives. He wants a partner and he needs someone to release it. It's all through scripture. Ezekiel says, Ezekiel 22, I sought for someone who would just stand in the gap with me and make up the hedge, but I found no one. I just wanted one person to partner with me. So, God has deposited his power in us. Here's point two. We must release his power through prayer. This is how we get Jesus in the center of our prayers because we understand how important prayer is. We must release his power through prayer. Now, it'll take me a moment to, to show you that it is through prayer that we release his power, but I gotta build a little bit of a case first. So there's a, a, an analogy that Jesus uses about the Holy Spirit um, and it's in John 7, and it's about the feast. It's the Feast of Tabernacles, so that you know. The Feast of Tabernacles was held once a year. It was one of three major feasts. It had three feasts actually in it, but uh, it lasted eight days. 
For seven days, they prayed for living water. And then Zechariah 14, 8 tells us that one day living water will flow from Jerusalem. So they would gather once a year in Jerusalem at the Feast of Tabernacles and they would pray for living water. They, but it was an eight-day feast. But for seven days, they prayed for living water. They had golden pitchers. They would go down to the Pool of Siloam. It's the pool closest to um, the temple. And they would fill it up water from the Pool of Siloam, they'd bring it back and they would pour it out on the altar and pray for living water. It, 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 it became like a ritual. And they would do this in the mornings, but normally in the afternoons and evenings then, um, they would party. It actually became an excuse to sin. Uh, many of them got drunk, many of them committed immorality. Now, I want you to think about this before you judge them because it's still going on in our society. Because the church implemented Lent for people to take 40 days before Easter and prepare their hearts. And um, on Ash Wednesday, many people party. That's where we got Mardi Gras from. That the church decided to get drunk and be immoral. Same thing was happening there. So on for seven days, they prayed for living water, and on the eighth day, it was like, if we don't get living water, let's just pray for rain. And so they prayed for rain. And on the eighth day of the feast, Jesus stands up and makes an announcement. So let me show it to you. John 7, uh, verse 37. On the last day, that's the eighth day, the great day of the feast, Feast of Tabernacles, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, he's referring mainly to four scriptures in Isaiah, out of his heart, out, I want you to notice the word out, not into his heart, out of his heart. Okay, think about it, if God's deposited the Holy Spirit in you, he's saying out of his heart out of his heart. By the way, what comes out of your heart? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Words come out of your heart. Prayers come out of your heart. Out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke, so I'm just showing you how this ties time to the Holy Spirit. Concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So I just wanna ask you a question. How big is the river flowing out of your heart? Because that's, much, that's how much power you're releasing into your marriage. That's how much power you're releasing into your career. That's how much power you're releasing into your health. That's how much power you're releasing into each kid you have. Is it a rushing river coming out of your heart or is it a trickle? I hope you're getting convicted because I am. Because I, I, I'm, I, I, I'm a bottom line person. Sometimes my prayers are bottom line and they should be more detailed. I should be praying lots of details over all of my sons and daughters and, and children, grandchildren and my marriage and my family and the calling that God's given me. I should be speaking it because as I speak, I release the power of God that's in me. <clears throat> this is why prayer is so important. See, let me say another way. You have your hand on the faucet of God's power. And you get mad at God because God doesn't move and God's saying, I already moved. Let me say it another way. Has God done everything for the work of salvation in your life to, for it to be complete? Well, he said it's finished. <laughs> on the cross, he said it's finished. I've done everything I need to do. But you need to do something, and we just did four weeks on it, grace, period. You need to receive his grace. It's a gift, you don't work for it, you just receive it. By grace through faith. 
So it's through faith. So you have to do something, right? Okay, let me ask you something else. Has God already sent the Holy Spirit? <laughs> yeah, you just have to receive him. When you receive him, out of your heart flows living waters. Isn't this incredible? See, when you talk about a faucet, most of us have more faith in the hot water faucet than we do in God. Because what happens when you turn the hot water faucet on? Turn it on, put your hand on it, under it, it's cold. And what do you do? You just stand there. Sometimes you go work, sometimes you go out and watch a movie and come back. <laughs> because it takes a while. I, I don't know where they locate the hot water heaters in some houses. I had a house, they put the hot water heater in three houses down, I think. <laughs> That's how long it took. But here's what we know, it's gonna get hot. Can I tell you something? When you pray, it may feel cold, but it's going to get hot. It's going to get hot. Just leave the faucet on of prayer. Um, why did Elijah pray seven times for rain, even after God said it's going to rain? I mean, God said it's going to rain, but he prayed seven times. Why did Jesus pray often? Why did Jesus pray three times in the garden? James talked about this last week. This is incredible. He brought out something. I feel like I've seen it, but I don't think I've seen it. Don't think I've said, ever seen it before. It's why prayer had been on my, on my heart all week. He, he says to, he prayed three times, but he said to Peter, I want you to pray so that you don't enter into temptation. The prayer was not for Jesus' sake, the prayer was for Peter's sake. By the way, Jesus prayed, and you know what it says? An angel appeared and strengthened him. Maybe an angel would have appeared and strengthened Peter if he'd have prayed. That was good. If you don't know good preaching when you hear it, you don't know how to recognize it, that was good. And by the way, this week, uh, James told me that on the phone, so he, he's actually the one that came up with that. All right, so <clears throat> he said, I didn't have time to bring this out, so I said, I'll do it. So anyway, and, but then I got convicted that I should give him the credit for it. So, hey, why did Daniel pray 21 days? Why didn't he just pray once? Well, I'm gonna show you why, and we'll show you why it's important to keep praying, all right? Daniel 10, uh, verse two. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. He was mourning because he was trying to eat right and exercise. <clears throat> it's true. It's what I, I fast. I mean, when I, I mourn when I fast. So I, he, he was fasting. He says, I ate no pleasant food. These words, these two words, pleasant food, in the Hebrew, it's two words too, blue bell. I ain't no blue bell. <laughs> Did y'all, I don't know if y'all know, uh, James and Bridget have this little five acres farm, you know, like cows, chickens, all that. Um, but they have these two dogs. What kind of dogs are they? Great Pyrenees. Great, great Pyrenees. I mean, they're huge. They're like ponies, these ponies or something running around. <laughs> but you know what they do? They protect their livestock. They used to have coyotes and Bobcats and all get in and get, they don't have any more. They, they protect those chickens. They protect those calves. It's what they do. You know what else they do? They protect the children. I think it's Belle. Belle is the female, the male is blue. And when, when Bray, little Bray, she's six years old, blue Belle. Okay, so wait. When, when Belle, when, when Bray goes down to the chicken house, Belle walks right beside her. Because they've learned these are ones that we protect too. I'm trying to remember why I told that. Oh, never mind, it doesn't, it has something to do with Bluebell. Um, oh, they let the kids name them, that's what it was, and the kids named them Bluebell, all right. Not that they eat a lot of Bluebell, all right. Uh, but he, he, he's praying and he says, 
I ate no pleasant food, no meat or wine came into my mouth. Watch, nor did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. He didn't anoint himself for three weeks, so his wife was mourning too. <clears throat> you know, you, don't, you, I don't mind if you don't eat, but just take a bath, please. And then watch in, in verse 12, an angel shows up and he said to me, this is the angel speaking, do not fear Daniel, watch. For from the first day, the first day you prayed, that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before God, your words, could we say your prayers? Your prayers were heard. And I have come because of your prayers. Jesus in the center of your prayers, your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia, remember there are principalities, in the air. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I'd been left alone there with the kings of Persia. Okay, this angel left heaven with Daniel's answer the first day. But there's a war going on. You wanna know why you pray? Because we're in a war. And you have the power of God deposited in you. How much of it are you releasing? How much are you measuring out? How much are you distributing? See, prayer is much more important than you think. See, we're not waiting on God to move. God's waiting on us to move. I think sometimes we're like um, cheetahs in prayer. A cheetah is the fastest animal, but he has a small heart. A heart, your heart pumps blood to your body, but you need to understand that's oxygen to your muscles. So your cheetah will chase something very fast. They can run 72 miles an hour. That's, that's fast. Debbie can drive faster, but that's fast. <laughs> um, so, Lord, please help Debbie drive under 50 miles an hour. All right. Um, but you ever see the cheetah on uh, Discovery Channel or something chasing a gazelle? And we all pray for the gazelle, you know? God help the gazelle, please, 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 please. What? Run, run, run. And then the cheetah starts like this, and we say, check, cut, cut, cut. And the, and the gazelle phew, cuts like that, and the cheetah, phew, you know, like that. And then the cheetah comes back and just about catches it. Gazelle cuts again, and the cheetah goes like this. And then the gazelle gets away. We all get excited. But what's the next shot, shot? It's the cheetah panting. Because he's out of breath. He needs more oxygen. I wonder sometimes if we pray fast and hard, but not long. And I think we need to learn to pray long. We need to keep praying. We need to keep releasing the power of God that has been deposited in us. In us. And here's the third point, this is really good. God adds his fire, and I put in parentheses power, to our prayers. Now that's good. We have power in us, but wouldn't it be great if God released more power from heaven in the situation? So here, here, here are the scriptures, Revelation 5, 8. Now when he, he, that's Jesus, had taken the scroll, the four living creatures, I preached a whole series on the four living creatures, that's what it's called, and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp, watch, and golden bowls. They had bowls full of incense, watch, which are the incense, which are the prayers of the saints. These bowls are filled with prayers. And then Revelation 8, verse 1, when he opened, this is an angel now, the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. That's why many theologians believe there will be no women in heaven. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> that it's an old, don't get mad at me, please, ladies. It's an old joke. And I'm actually, the only reason I turned is I'm gonna turn it around on me, okay? That's the only reason I, I'm, that's the only reason I said it. I don't believe it at all. 
I, you know, at all. Wouldn't say anything like that. It's a horrible remark. Here's, here's, but I did say it because I want to turn it. When I was young and stupid, in my 20s, I used to use this as a joke. And, you know, no women in heaven because, you know, there was silence for half an hour. This little old lady comes up, tugs on my jacket after the service and said, there won't be any preachers there either. Okay. So that's why I use the joke, okay? <laughs> Verse 2, and I saw the seven angels who stand before God to give them, uh, and to them were given seven trumpets. Then another angel, watch, having a golden censer. It's one of these golden bowls that, that have the prayers of saints in it. Came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of the saints. Even uh, upon the golden altar, which is for the throne, and the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints. No doubt the prayers of the saints are in these bowls. Ascended before God from the angel's hand. Now watch what happens when they ascend before God. Then the angel took the censer, that bowl filled with prayers, filled it with fire from the altar and threw it to the earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and earthquake. In other words, it changed things on earth. See, when your bowl gets full, then the angel adds the fire of God to it and throws it to the earth. That's pretty amazing. So you have power in you, and yet God adds his power to your prayers, and heaven and earth meet. It's kind of like if you've seen those uh, waterfalls that are bowls, and water pours pours in this bowl, and when it fills up, it tips, pours into another bowl, that and tip, okay. So when your bowl gets full, not only does it tip and come to the earth, but an angel is right there to put fire in it and Send the fire with your prayers. He adds fire to your prayers. Think about the fire that fell when Elijah prayed. Think about the fire that, it always represents power, the fire that, that stood between the Israelites and the army that was chasing them. Think about the fire that fell from heaven when the Holy Spirit came. Tongues of fire rested on their head. The fire of God. It's power. And even Luke 3.16 says, he will baptize you. This is John the Baptist talking about Jesus. Jesus will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, fire. And then, if you'll fill your bowl up, an angel is right there in heaven to add the fire of God, more power, and send it to the earth. It's pretty amazing. So my, 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 my question is, how full are your bowls? How full is your family bowl? Does, is it only just a quarter full or half full, or is it full enough to tip? How full is your uh, marriage bowl? How full is your uh, career bowl? How full is the whatever you're going through right now that you are wanting God to move and God's wanting you to move? and release the power of God in you. So some of you have heard the, this testimony. Um, you know, I grew up in a, a good godly home. Uh, my mother on her side were church planners. Uh, my father on his side, he hates it when I say it, but they were uh, heathens. And um, <laughs> my father was the first Christian in his family. And the way he became a Christian was my grandfather um, Uh, worked for the Department of Transportation, and one of his jobs was to put asphalt in potholes. Think about that. And he, for a while, he worked with a man named Ray Alexander. And Ray Alexander was a Christian. He was telling him about Christ. So my grandfather said to him, hey, I'd like to hear more about Jesus. And uh, Ray Alexander said, why don't you come over after dinner tonight, and I can share with you. So my grandfather said, yes. My father was 16 years old, and just gotten his driver's license. So when he found out my grandfather was going somewhere, he said, well, can I drive you? And so my grandfather said, yes, but you have to stay outside. So he sat in the car for a while and listened to the radio and all, and then he got tired, so he went up and he sat on the 
steps of the front porch, but back then there was no air conditioning in homes. And so there was the, the door was open, but the screen door was shut. And Ray Alexander was sharing the gospel with my grandfather and my father sitting on the front porch through the screen door heard the gospel for the first time in his life. 16 years old. And my, uh, Ray Alexander said to my grandfather, would you like to accept Christ? My grandfather said no. Not at this time, I wanna think about it. But Ray Alexander brilliantly said, well if you ever do wanna accept Christ, pray a prayer like this. And my father, sitting on the front steps, prayed that prayer. And then his family. I had two brothers, and I don't mean this wrong, or it's very sad, but one brother committed suicide, the other brother died a few months after he got out of prison. That was the family line my father came from. My father went on to college and went on to be very successful and owned his own company and, and was a very large giver to the kingdom, which is where I got my giving from, which is where some of you got your giving from, Gateway being one of the largest churches to giving to, to missions around the world. Um, and so, uh, 40 something years later, I got concerned once I got saved about my grandfather, he was 78. So I, we were having a family reunion, so I prayed for a time to be able to talk to him alone. And for some reason, we went back to the house. Everybody was outside down by the lake. He and I were back in the house alone. So I started talking to him about the Lord, and he said, you know, a man named Ray Alexander shared this with me 40 years ago, but I said no but I'd like to say yes today. And I led my grandfather to the Lord 40 years later when he was 78 years old. And we saw a change in his life. The next Sunday, my father went to visit him. I, I hadn't talked to my dad yet. And so I called him to talk to him and I said, hey, I want you to know that uh, he accepted Christ. He said, I could see the change in him. I could see he changed. And so anyway, he lived to 82, Well, when he passed away, I started thinking about this man, Ray Alexander, and I thought, I think he'd like to know. So I, this is, you know, some of you won't understand this, but I called directory assistance to get his number. <laughs> um, we didn't have the internet back then. We actually had to ask somebody, some, you know, to find out a phone number, you know, right there, and the people we asked weren't named Siri, but anyway, um, so I got his phone number and called him and said, do you remember Joe Morris? And he said, yes, I still pray for him to this day. And, and I said, well, I want you to know I'm his grandson and I led him to the Lord before he died. And he, I said, and my father, did you know my father accepted Christ sitting on the steps? He started crying, he said, I never knew that. And I said, well, my father raised me in a Christian home and, and became a, a huge giver to the kingdom and, um, and then I became a minister, a pastor, an evangelist first, and then a pastor. And now thousands of people have accepted Christ, but it's all because of you. And uh, I said, you said you still pray for my grandfather even to this day. I said, why, why is that? He said, well, um, when I witness to a person, I put his name in the back of my Bible. And I pray for him every day, all the names in the back of my Bible until they accept Christ. And when they accept Christ, I put a check beside their name. And this is what he said. He said, your grandfather is the only name in the back of my Bible that didn't have a check beside it. And when I get off the phone, I'm gonna put a check beside your grandfather's name. See, you can have Jesus in the center of your prayers. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And every week we ask the Holy Spirit, what are you saying? And obviously, one thing he's saying to all of us, including me, is I want you to pray. I want you to release the power of God on the earth because I deposited the power of God in you and the person of the Holy Spirit. But it's your words, 
your prayers that release the Holy Spirit on this earth. So just ask the Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? Lord, I want to tell you, thank you, thank you, thank you for sending Jesus to save us from our sins and sending the Holy Spirit to empower us. And I pray, Lord, that we will release your power to a lost and hurting world. In Jesus' name, amen.